Let's just put our hands together and thank all the mothers, all the women of our church. Yes. Yeah, we were, gonna, we were gonna get carnations, and I was in Sam's, and I saw all of these roses there, and just on a whim, I bought all these roses. I had my cart just packed full of them, and as I'm walking around through Sam's, uh, people are like staring at me, and somebody came up and was like, what are you doing with all those flowers? And I just said, I got a lot of mothers in my life, so. <laughs> but uh, I, I caused a scene. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, everybody. We're thankful for uh, the mothers in our, that are in our church family and the women in our church family. We give thanks for them. Um, Father, we just pray and ask you to speak to us through your word. We just thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for mercy. We thank you for grace. And Lord, we just pray that you'll give us ears to hear and eyes to see the truth that you have for us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Today, we're going to look at uh, Esther. I was just praying last week about where to go on Mother's Day and what to talk about and what to share. And the story about Esther was just so compelling to me as I began to think and pray about it. The Lord began to just put uh, a message on my heart that I want to share with you. The Bible is full of many, many stories about some awesome women all through the Word of God. We see women of faith. We see women of conviction. We see women of courage. We see Jochebed saving her baby's life. We see Deborah stepping up and taking the lead and fighting for her own country. Uh, we see very prominent women just as involved in the ministry of Jesus as the 12 apostles were. Today we're going to look at Esther, though. Esther, her birth name was Hadassah. And her story is absolutely gripping. Her story is inspiring. If there was ever anybody that had a strong sense of place and destiny, it was Esther. At first, though, when she was younger, she didn't realize that God had a special plan for her life. And I think many of us are like that during different times in our lives. We're living our life. We love God. We're thankful that we're saved. But we don't know how God wants to use us. But he does. God wants to use every single one of you. The Lord Jesus saved you so that you could find your place and that you can serve him and you can serve other people and make a difference in your life. Uh, Esther's parents died when she was young. She was adopted by her older cousin Mordecai. She grew up in a very strange country with different customs, different values than the Hebrew heritage. Esther lived in a time when the Jews were exiled from their homeland and they were living in what was the great Persian Empire of the day. The Persian Empire stretched all the way from India to Ethiopia. Esther's life was challenging. She suffered hardships in her life, but she received at one point in her life a rare opportunity. King Xerxes uh, was having a great banquet. His wife was hosting all the women of prominence in the kingdom in a separate place. And on the seventh day of that banquet, we are told that King Xerxes summoned his wife Vashti to come, to come and be seen in the court. He wanted to show all the prominent men how beautiful his wife was. We don't know the reason why or what happened, but she said no. She desisted. She said she didn't want to go, and it so angered the king, that he decided he's going to get a new queen. And so he had all the most beautiful young unmarried women in the land all brought together and presented to him. And as we read the story, Esther was included. She was Jewish, but she didn't let the fact of her race be known at the time. And she, of all women, was chosen by the king to be the queen. <laughs> I mean, at this moment, wow, it looks like it, she was destined to live her life happily ever after. But life is not like that, is it? Then along comes this man named Haman. Haman was a descendant of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were the very first people who attacked Israel when they were entering into the promised land. Uh, all the men in the court would bow down to Haman. He was given a position of prominence, but Mordecai would not bow down. Mordecai, Esther's cousin, because he reverenced God, he would not bow down to Haman. And that's the way it is for the followers of God. When the whole world bows down, we won't. When the whole world gives in, we don't. And then we're hated because of it. Here in this story, Mordecai hates the Jews. Not just, not just uh, excuse me, 
uh, in this story, Haman hates the Jews, not just Mordecai. It happened with the Romans and the Jews. It happened with the Christians uh, before the Romans. And the Bible tells us it's going to happen in the end. When the whole world bows down to the Antichrist, we who know the Lord Jesus Christ, we will not. Because we're in in the middle of this cosmic war. Evil is hammering back at God. And we are in this war to the very end. So Haman is an official in the king's court. He's given immense power, and he uses that power to turn against the Jews. He plotted to have every single Hebrew in the kingdom of Persia assassinated, killed, murdered. He was literally the original Hitler. You know, Satan has always tried to pollute and persecute and eradicate the Jews. Haman plotted to kill the Jews simply because of his grudge with Esther's uncle, Mordecai. You know, there are some things that we just need to never, ever, ever forget. Some things we must always have fresh in our cultural memory so that evils like this don't happen again. November the 9th, 1938, in Nazi Germany, the Nazis planned a pogrom, an ethnic cleansing against the Jews. And it occurred throughout all of Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. Riots broke out. It was called the Kristallnacht. It was the German night of broken glass. They shattered the windows of Jewish shops and stores and homes. They set fires all over the country. They they devoured synagogues and Jewish businesses. Gangs of Nazis destroyed 7,000 businesses, 900 synagogues, and 91 Jews were killed that night, and 30,000 Jewish men were sent to concentration camps. Himmler who oversaw this, he said this, they do not belong to the same species, but only imitate humans. They are as far removed from us as animals are from humans. Now, where does that kind of hatred come from? It didn't start in Hitler's heart. It did not start in Himmler's heart. It did not start in Haman's heart. Satan is the ultimate hater of everybody who loves God. And he is waging war against the people of God even to this day. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, look what it says. It says, Then the dragon, furious with the woman, went off to make war on the rest of her offspring and those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So who is is Satan making war with? Identified very clearly here. If If you hold to the commandments of God... And if you hold to the testimony of Jesus, then Satan is at war against you. And you all know this. You know know this. We see, we're watching TV. We see the news. We see what's going on. This is a struggle that faithful Christians in America are facing even today right now. We will not conform to the new orthodoxies of race, morality, sexual orientation, gender identity, and abortion. This is the main reason why Orthodox Christianity is despised today in some areas in our country. We have a culture all around us that does not understand our reverence and our regard to the Bible. They see the Bible as a book, but we receive it as the Word of God. The Bible teaches us not just about doctrine. The Bible teaches us about morality too. The Bible teaches us what it means to be a man. The Bible teaches us what it means to be a woman. The Bible teaches us that the family was designed by God, our creator, of one man and one woman, raising children to walk with God, not raising children to walk away from God. God intended for a husband and wife to raise children to know their creator. And life is a gift from God. Children don't come from people. Children come through people. But the author of life is God Almighty himself. That's why we say life is sacred. Amen? So the Christian gospel is a judgment of this world. It's a judgment of this world. Do you remember we are told all have sinned and what? All sin. Everybody sins and falls short of the glory of God. Everybody sins. And you know, I've told you this many times. We as Christians should not be surprised when people who don't know God live like they don't know God. That shouldn't shock us. That that shouldn't surprise us. But we have what we call the gospel, the good news, the truth. And the gospel is an indictment of the world. The gospel teaches us that our sin put Jesus on the cross. 
Our sin did that. I was reading a story about R.A. Torrey, and he was talking to a man about sin. And the man was saying, I'm not a terrible sinner. I don't have bad sins in my life. And Torrey looked at him and said, you're a murderer. And the man was shocked. He said, a murderer? I'm not a murderer. He said, yes, your sin caused the Son of God to be murdered. The gospel is an indictment against the sins of the world. And the gospel teaches us that we have to repent. We have to repent and believe. And then we are forgiven and we are saved. So Christians, listen, we should not expect to be warmly embraced by the world or even to be tolerated. And it's not going to get better. Go read Matthew chapter 24 when Jesus tells us about the end times. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. But we have to take our stand, not back up and not shut up and not be ashamed of Jesus Christ because that is the name that is above every name. Here's what Jesus told us. He said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So Christianity tells the world what it does not want to hear. And when Mordecai discovered Haman's plot... He went to Esther, and he sought, he implored, he begged her to save the people. Esther, you have to do something. Mordecai wanted her to appeal to the king. Now, in some ways, this story is very familiar uh, to the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was positioned in a unique place to help Jerusalem. And here, Esther is positioned in a very unique place to help the Jews. So what are some things that we can learn from Esther? Here's the first thing that I want you to see. God has a plan for you right where you are. You are never out of place when you realize that God is with you. If you have a relationship with God, God wants to use you with your skills, your abilities, your experiences, and he wants to use you right where you are. Now, Esther needed courage. At that time, as somebody appeared before the king, unsummoned, And if the king wasn't pleased with it, that person could be executed. And she knew it. She knew it. At this point, we are told that she had not been summoned to see the king for 30 days. If she just all of a sudden went to him on her own, she knew that she could be risking her life. And at first, she refused. Let me just read to you what the Bible says, Esther chapter 4 verses 13 and 14, and Mordecai told them to tell Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Those are very powerful words, aren't they not? Mordecai's words changed the way Esther felt about her situation. I love this. For such a time as this. Don't you love those different passages in the Bible that are powerful moments like that? Like when Joshua stood up before all the people and said, listen, you choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Anybody say amen to that in your life? Those are, powerful, those are powerful words. Or in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45, when David was getting ready to go down and face Goliath, he looked Goliath in the eye and he says, you come to me with the sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. I love those moments. I would say they're Clint Eastwood moments, right? Go ahead, make my day, but they're not. <laughs> they, predate, they predate the greatest actor that ever lived, right? Daniel chapter 3, when, when the three boys were brought before the king, and the king says, listen, this is a big misunderstanding. He loved these guys. They excelled among all the other young men that were being trained in the Babylonian court. He said, let's just settle this right now. Let the music play, and you just bow down right now, and we'll be done with this, and let's just move on. But these were men of God. They bowed when everybody else stood, and they stood when everybody else bowed. And they looked the king in the eye, and they said to him, The God whom we serve is able to deliver us 
from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, I love this part, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. That's the heart that the church needs to have today. We will not serve the gods of this culture, the gods of this country, even to the point of death if we have to, because we know that those who confess the name of Jesus Christ, they never die. Never. Jesus, I love it, when he looks at Peter, he says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I love these powerful moments. Romans chapter 1, when the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Anybody in here ashamed of the gospel? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mordecai says, Esther, maybe you are here for such a time as this. Esther, God has placed you here. Esther, God has positioned you in this place. For the first time, Esther realized God wanted to use her right where she was. And God wants to use you right where you are at. He really does. She was uniquely in a place to accomplish something that nobody else could accomplish but her. And this is true of you. In your circle of friends, in your circle of influence, you are uniquely placed to have influence that nobody else can have influence. You're uniquely placed where you are, and God wants to use you. So Mordecai helped her to see this, and she was ready to do something. And here's her response in Esther chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Esther came to realize that her place, her good fortune, was not just for her own personal blessing, but that God wanted to use it for his purposes. She had been in the palace for God's purposes. I want you to see this. Courage comes when you understand you are in God's place for God's purposes. Courage comes when you know that right where you're at, you're there because God wants you to be there. I want you to know I've thought this has always been so important in life is for us to have that sense that God gave me this job, that God led me in this direction, that God is the one to open this door, that God is the one that closed that door. Because when you know that you're where you're at because that's what God has allowed or what God has put together. It gives you courage and it gives you confidence, doesn't it? And if you're not there, I encourage you to do the exact same thing that Esther did. Fast, fast and pray until you know that you know that you are where God wants you to be and that you're doing what God wants you to do. There's no greater joy in life than fulfilling the plans that God has for us. Amen. Anybody know that? I want you to see this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, 24. In fact, let's read this together. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. I am serving the Lord. I work for God. Would you just say that? I work for God. One more time. I work for God. I don't care who signs your paycheck. I don't care what it looks like. Ultimately, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you work for God. And God wants to use you right where you're at. God has a place for you. He has placed us where he needs us, where he wants to use us. So shine, shine, be a light. We need to rise to the hour. Every single one of us who follow the Lord Jesus Christ, our nation is in a place right now where every single one of us in our sphere of influence, wherever we find ourselves, we need to remind ourselves when we get up in the morning, I work for God. God, use me today to shine for you. We need to rise to the hour. Winston Churchill, he said, in every age, there comes a time when a leader must come forward to meet the needs of the hour. Therefore, there is no potential leader who does not have an opportunity to make a positive difference in society. But listen to this. Tragically, there are times when a leader does not rise to the hour. 
I want you to know, deep in my heart, it's time for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to rise to the hour. And I encourage you to come. Come on Wednesday nights in our prayer time. We are on our face. We are praying. We are seeking God for a revival in our nation because America needs a revival, brothers and sisters. America needs what God can do. And the decision is ours as to whether or not we will rise to the hour as God's people in this day. So here are Esther's words of wisdom to us. Number one, there are times when you may not understand God's plan and God's purpose for your life. There are times when life throws us a curveball, right? There are times when things happen to us that we think God must have made a mistake here. I I wouldn't have allowed that. I would have stopped that. I would have prevented that. And in those times, we've got to pull back and just have faith and trust in God. Because there are some times we don't see the hand of God, like Charles Spurgeon said, but we've got to believe in, we have to have faith in, we have to have confidence in the heart of God. That regardless of the chaos that's going on around me, I know that my God is on the throne. Amen? And just because I don't understand God's plan, and just because I don't understand God's purpose, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a plan, and it doesn't mean that he doesn't care for you. Have faith in God. Keep calling out to him. Fast and pray. Joseph was in a prison. I'm sure I think so often about Joseph. I mean, he had a vision that God raised him up above all of his brothers. And he's so excited about this God-given vision. He goes and runs and tells his brothers, listen, guys, I had a vision. I had a dream from the Lord. And the Lord showed me in my dream that I was going to be elevated above all of you. And then I'm sure he was shocked that his brothers didn't say, oh, that's awesome. No, they threw him in a pit. They sold him as a slave. He finds out that he's accused of something he didn't do, and now he's thrown down into a prison, and he is right where God wants him to be. Think about that. Think about Abraham. He's on a journey. God says, go. Go where, Lord? Just go. Go where? He doesn't give him a destination. He just says, go. God's going to direct. God's going to guide, and he did. Moses is right there in the king's court, right where God wanted him to be. Saul He's the persecutor of the first church. He was raised at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the wisest, most educated men of the day. Even in secular Jewish texts, this guy is revered, and he was raised at the feet of Gamaliel. Why? Because God was preparing him by the inspiration of the Spirit to write most of the New Testament that we still read today. Amen? So you have to remember, God is in control. Here's the second thing we learned from Esther. When you realize God's purpose for your life, pursue it. Run after it with reckless abandon. Go after it. Seize the opportunity. Take the chance. Move forward. Don't delay. Rise to the hour. When Mordecai explained that God may have made her queen so she could make a difference, she said, fast for me, pray for me. I'm moving forward. If I die, I die, but I'm going to pursue this. She took a chance. And so I encourage you, when you... Get that door open, and you know that it's God there. Pursue it. Run after it, and know that God's going to take care of the rest. Here's the third thing we learn from Esther. Taking a risk is easier when you know that God is in control. She said, if I perish, I perish. If I fail, I fail. But I'm not going to let this moment go by. If I don't do it, I don't do it. If I don't accomplish it, I don't accomplish it. But I know God's on a throne And I know that this cause is worth dying for. This is a risk worth taking, and she moved forward with it. The story goes that the king did receive Esther. Let's have our worship team come. The king did receive Esther, and the king began to, in in, in a moment, began to think about, are there people that have done wonderful things that I have not recognized? He goes back through the history books, and he comes to find out that Mordecai had saved him from a plot that two men were going to have the king assassinated. And he is ready to exalt Mordecai and bless him, and then Esther comes and tells of this plot, and the king finds out that Esther is Jewish and Mordecai is Jewish, and This man has plotted to kill every single one of the Jews, and the whole thing just flips just like that. 
and the very gallows that Haman had made for Mordecai that morning when he got up, that afternoon, they were gallows that were used for him. And God turned the whole situation around just like that for such a time as this. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we pray. I know the very first thing the Lord wants to do in your life is for you to receive forgiveness, for you to follow him. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I love Romans 10, 13. It says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Not might be saved, not could be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you've not made that first step, that first step of maturity and obedience in following Jesus, I encourage you to do that today. Right where you're at, just say, Jesus, I, I repent. And I don't want to walk away from you. I want to walk with you. I want to walk with you, Lord. Maybe you're in a place right now where your life doesn't seem to make sense in your eyes. In your eyes. You don't know why you're where you're at. Why don't you just fast? Fast and pray. Set aside some time. Fasting is refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. Fasting is like us saying, getting a word from you, God, is more important than feeding myself. Lord, I need you to speak to me. Maybe you're in a place right now in your life where you just want to say, Lord, use me. Use me. Maybe I have this job. Maybe I'm in this place. Maybe I'm where I am for such a time as this. Show me what that is, Lord. Show me what that is. It's awesome how God can take what's sometimes the ordinary things of the world and make them spiritual, and make them worship, make them ministry, if you give it to Him. Maybe you're here and you need a breakthrough in your life, just a spiritual breakthrough. Jill and I will be here to pray with you. You can come and pray and kneel at the steps. I wish we'd all take time during our week, Sundays and during our week, to get on our knees and pray, God, revive us again. Lord, revive us again. Lord, let us see another spiritual awakening in our land. We need to intercede. If we don't pray that prayer, who will? So let's just pray for our nation, pray for our city. You do as the Lord leads you. Let's stand now as we worship him.